Good morning. Let's stand to our feet and let's worship. starting a new series, a desperation series today. And we're going to sing a new song this morning. It's going to be with us throughout the series. It's called Meet Us Here. So as we continue to ask the Lord, to seek the Lord, and to knock at his throne for certain things for our lives, for our families, let's continue to seek him first 
in all those things. Amen? So the chorus of this song goes like this. Be the first thing, the last thing, all that we're seeking, the one thing we're asking, one thing we're needing. As every hand is raised, every heart draws near, meet us here. Sing that. Be the first thing, the last thing, all that we're seeking. We enter your courts with praise Every song like a banner we raise We're after your presence Come now and feel this place We run in toward your throne, set our eyes on your face alone. We're after your presence from heaven to come swing low. And as we sing, we lift you up. As we sing, come be the first thing, the last thing. All that we're seeking, the one thing we're asking, one thing we're needing. As every hand is raised, every heart draws near, meet us treasure we're searching for our joy is your presence our wonder and our reward as we sing we lift you up as we sing come be the first thing the last thing all that we're seeking the one thing we're asking one
as we continue in worship, let's just take a moment to settle our spirits. It is well. 
it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. It is well. Hey! 
I'm no longer a slave to fear Cause I am a child of God And I'm no longer a slave to fear Cause I am a child of God
this morning thank you for wrapping us up in your grace and securing us forever in your family we love you lord in jesus name amen well let's turn to one another this morning and greet each other in love Well, good morning once again. It's so good to see you. It's good to be here and starting the uh, fall season all together in one place at a time. It's just been wonderful. Uh, again, if you're our guest, we want to welcome you. Just thanks for coming and hanging out with us. We just always enjoy spending time with each other and uh, enjoying each other's company. And speaking of enjoying each other's company, there's going to be plenty of opportunities to do that in the next few months. You're just going to see a lot of different activities starting up again. And so we want to invite you to be part of that, uh, not only here, but around the community. There's just different things going on. And we just hope that what you do is you get that opportunity to plug in and be part of something um, that encourages you and helps you grow. Uh, speaking of that, I was, uh, Annette and I had an opportunity along with a few of the other, uh, rest of us, we got to host a young families, a growing families barbecue a couple of weeks ago. We just had a great time. Um, young families, man, it's hard. It's hard to be a mom and dad today. And so we got together. We just talked about what that feels like and what are the things that may, maybe we can do together to help each other. And uh, we, just, uh, we just did all of that. It was great. And I, I'm so happy to be able to announce to you that we have uh, our new Young Families leaders, and it's Brian and Shannon Rance. And so they're going to be leading our Young Families group. So there you go. There you go. And many of you know Shannon because she just led worship. But Brian and Shannon are going to 
help us uh, with young families. And listen, if you're, you're there in a young family, and however you look at that, whatever it means to be a young family for you, we want you to be part of that and uh, make those connections. It's just good to make connections today with people who are going through the same things that you're going through. Uh, we want you to have that kind of support. And so I'm so thankful for Brian and Shannon and uh, their willingness to say yes and help us with this. So we're, we're pretty excited about that, really excited. Well, here's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward. Uh, today we're going to just take some time and receive our morning tithe and offering. And if you're our guest, don't feel obligated to give. Uh, we do this for those that call New Life their church home, Can Be Four Square. And the reason we do this is because we are committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, we are committed uh, to making disciples that make disciples for Jesus. And so when we take offering, when we receive tithe and offering, what we're doing is we're saying, Lord, help us be good stewards to make disciples not only here in our community but around the world. And that's what we've been called to do. That's the call of this place, this church. And so we want to continue that call, and it happens because of generous people like you. So let's pray together. Father, we just thank you today for the amazing work that you do in our lives and the way that, <clears throat> that you uh, supply our needs, the way that you work in our lives. Your resources are abundant. Uh, they're overflowing. And so we look to you. You are the Father, uh, our Father, who brings provision to our lives that we need. So touch us today, Lord Jesus. We give back to you just some of what you have given us so that the gospel of Jesus would be perpetuated and uh, it would grow around the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It's so good to have you here at Canby Four Square Church with us this morning. My name's Hudson Mickle, and I have just a few announcements for you. There are still a few spots left for this year's women's retreat. Special guest speaker Bo Stern will be sharing on the theme Wild and Free. It is going to be an absolutely incredible retreat. Uh, and if you're interested, go online to canbyfoursquare.com to register. Canby Cares is coming up September 22nd, and we need your help. We need volunteers. So if you're interested in attending this event or helping out, go online to canbycares.org for more information. If you're still looking for a place to, to plug in, whether it's to serve or to be a part of a small group, make sure to go check out the patio and the lobby for this is the last weekend of our expo. We've got a couple of great classes coming up, and the, the first one being Rooted. If you don't know where to start, start here. Rooted is a great way to plant some roots in our community and be a part of an absolutely awesome small group environment. The second class we have coming up is MTI, or Ministry Training Institute. I was a part of this class last year, and I just have to say, it is absolutely fantastic. Um, it will bring about life change and some uh, incredible experiences. And for the first time ever, we can offer this class completely free. So if you're interested, make sure to sign up for MTI. All right, everybody, that's all the announcements I have for you today. Remember, if you have any questions, you can always go online to canbyfoursquare.com. Also, there will be prayer teams available at the end of this service. If you need prayer, be bold. Go up to the front of the room and get prayer because these people would love to pray with you. not until we reach the end of ourselves you know the end the place where you negotiate with God at the end of your options and the end of controlling all of the outcomes it's here in this place when we have nowhere else to turn that we look to Jesus see he's the one who sees us when we fall the one who hears us when we cry out the one who cares about our pain. It's moments like these 
where we need to draw closer to God than ever before. It is this place where we find ourselves, where we are desperate, desperate to see God do something incredible, do something amazing. So for that, we ask, we seek, and we knock. For the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at desperation and how desperation can bring us hope. It might not appear that way. It might not even feel that way. But on the other side of desperation, God always has hope. There's always a reason why he brings you through what he's bringing you through, even right now. If you're going through a time or a season of desperation, be sure you know that God is leaning in, that God cares when you feel separated, when you feel alone, that God is there that he loves those hearts that cry out to him in desperation. And so we want, to look, we want to look at that and see what that's like throughout Scripture. We're going to do some journeying through the Bible. We're going to look at some places where people came to the end of themselves and they dealt with and felt desperate to call on God. Well, if you're a part of my family, you know something about me that some others might not know. I hate to shop. Uh, I'm not a shopper. Uh, I have people in my family that love to shop. They even love to drag me along to shop. I think they like it just so they can poke fun at me, you know. And I get into those places, those shopping centers, and I, I get a little claustrophobic. That's just me. And there's just too many people and just all kinds of things. And Annette knows when I disappear, I just go and sit in the great outdoors and just watch people. And that's my shopping. I just look around and see what's going on. I'm not a guy that uh, goes against what Annette's advice might be when it comes to buying clothes either. You know, I have zero sense when it comes to fashion. And uh, I did it one time. I, I went against her, her better judgment. Uh, when I looked in the mirror at the store, at the re retail store, I looked really good. And so I got a nice shirt and a pair of slacks. I looked in the mirror there, and I thought, I'm getting this. And she's saying, don't do it. Don't get that. And I'm thinking, I'm looking really good. I look good. I'm taking it home. This is what I'm going to get. So I went home, and I kept my clothes on, and I looked in the mirror at home. And I didn't look anything like I looked in the mirror in the store. <laughs> I mean, everything changed. It wasn't that good looking anymore. Uh, it, it didn't fit me like it fit me in the store. You see, Annette knew something that I didn't know, and it's called a skinny mirror. How, how many have heard of skinny mirrors before? Have you heard of those? Well, you could have told me that a long time ago to save me a lot of grief. But I realize that a lot of retailers put skinny mirrors in their stores so that when you look at their product, you want to take it home with you. And that's exactly, exactly what I did. You know, I, I, I get it. We rather not face the hard truth. We... We've gotten pretty comfortable with people telling us what we want to hear. Uh, we, we like our egos to be stroked. We like certain things to be said about us that may not be true. In fact, the latest trend on college campuses, maybe you've heard this, is called a safe zone. You know, a safe zone is a place on campus where students can come without worrying about getting their feelings hurt. No free speech in the safe zone. You cannot say things that would be considered disagreeable or make someone else uncomfortable. It's where students can come just to feel safe. And we kind of like that feeling. We like, kind of like being in places we feel unchallenged where no one will disagree with us. But that's not always the best thing for us. There are times in our life, many times in our life, the best thing that can happen to us is to hear the hard truth. And to really be challenged in a way that causes us to grow. And because honestly, the only way we really do grow is through challenges in life. You might be facing some of those challenges right now and thinking, what in the world am I doing here and what is the purpose of this challenge? What is the reason for this desperate moment? I can say that God has a plan for you. And I can say, pretty sure, that God's saying, I want you to grow through this time. We need to hear hard truths. You see, as a church, we want to be a safe place, but this is not a safe zone. See, the most loving thing that we can do as family is to look into the truth of God's Word, that we would hold the truth of God's Word up to our own life and say, God, examine my heart by your Word. 
James chapter 5, verse 25 says that God's word is a mirror to our soul. And God's word as a mirror never tells a lie and always tells the truth. So that when you hold up God's word to your life, it'll teach you about yourself, it'll teach you about your relationship with God, and it will teach you about your relationship with others. That is the design of God's word. And that's what we want to do. We want to dive into God's word and hold it up and say, God, you're telling me the truth. And you always do it in great love. So in the next several weeks, we're going to be dump, jumping into this series. It's called uh, The Gift of Desperation. And this is what I, I pray happens, that in our desperate moments, we realize that we have been given a gift. It may not feel like it when you're in the middle of desperation, but when you get to the other side and you look back, you recognize, you have that aha moment, and you say, <laughs> that was a gift from God. It wasn't something I would bring on myself. It wasn't something that I would volunteer for. But God just brought it my way. I've gone through that time. I look back and I thank God because what he did is he gave me a gift that grew my character, that grew my relationships and caused me to go deeper with Jesus Christ. You see, those are the moments we realize that. That moments of desperation can change our lives, that we can be transformed, that desperation is a gift from God. You see, God's power doesn't come until we understand our weakness. We want God's victory, but that only happens with our vulnerability. We want God's deliverance, but that comes only after our desperation. You see, all the things we desire and all the things we want are the same things that God wants and desires for you, but he has a way of getting you there, and it's his way. It's his way of bringing us to that place of recognition, of seeing him. In all of this, what we need to know is that God is drawn to the desperate. Again, if you feel like going through a desperate time <laughs> that you're doing this struggle alone or you feel like no one really cares or you're off to the side, kind of the outside looking in, you can be sure of this when it comes to God. He's looking at you. He sees the desperation and God is drawn to desperate hearts. So if you're desperate today, God is drawn to you. That's the promise he gives us. Many of you would say that the closest I've ever been to God the closest I've ever experienced his presence is when I've gone through a time of desperation, a time when I couldn't fix my problem, a time when I couldn't manipulate my problem, a time when I couldn't work myself out of the problem, and I realized at that moment how much I needed God, how desperate I was for him. And so this morning, we're going to take a look at a story uh, about a, a, a desperate woman, a soon-to-be or would-be mother, and she was desperate for a child. So with that, would you open your Bibles with me? If you have your Bibles here today, open it to 1 Samuel chapter 1. It's at the very one-third first part of the Bible. And if you do that, you'll find this beautiful passage of Scripture. I'm going to encourage you to do this as well. We're going to only cover a bit of it here this morning. So if you would take it and read it even further, uh, because I think chapters 1 and 2 are worth uh, worth the read. So take some time and do that because it's here when we look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1, we see the prayer uh, of a soon to be desperate parent. And even more, this is a, a, a woman who wants to be a mother. That motherhood is in her heart, but she doesn't have a child. She's without a child, but she longs for a child. And out of that longing, she has this time, these moments of great desperation. And I can say this about what I know about moms is there's no one else on the planet that prays more for their kids than their mothers. And I, I can say this, my, my mom and my grandmother have taken me out of the pit of hell by their prayers and got me into the kingdom of God. And I think that when you look around and you say, yeah, moms do that, that's just what moms are about. They're tenacious when it comes to their kids and grandkids. Well, you're going to hear this in a young lady named Hannah today because she wants so bad to be a mother and she's praying this desperate prayer. And what we see here and here's what we know is that God leans in to the desperate hearted. 
And hold on to that thought. Hold on to that reality as you work through this story because I think it will make a difference in your life. Because in 1 Samuel chapter 1, we meet this woman named Hannah. And she longs again to be a mother. She's married to a man named Elkanah. And uh, we, we, we go to verse 2 on this, and this is what it says. It says, he had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. Now, I don't want you to skip over this and just pass it off and say, well, that, that's great. It just says it in a, in a brief sentence. When you pass over this without thinking about that last phrase, but Hannah had none, you miss the impact of what the Spirit is wanting to say to you. This is horrible for her. This is torturous for her. And in fact, when you read this, this is a recipe for despair, right here in verse 2. Now, the Bible doesn't endorse polygamy. Some people ask that. Well, she had two wives. Well, it doesn't endorse polygamy. It's a horrible, bad idea. Polygamy wreaks havoc on families in the Bible. God's plan is one man, one woman. Uh, we see that uh, the overflow of those choices made still haunt us today if you go to the Middle East. Uh, we have someone that we study and look at and love his life. His name is Abraham. But there's problems in the Middle East because of some decisions Abraham made that had to do with more than one woman. So this isn't a great idea. But this is where Hannah finds herself. And I don't want to ever underestimate the pain of infertility. The pain of infertility should never be underestimated. In fact, there was a study done not too long ago that said women rate infertility on the same level as they do terminal illness. It's, it's a horrible thing to deal with. And here, Hannah faced incredibly difficult social pressures being infertile. Now, I don't want to downplay what women might feel today, but you've got to go back and put yourself in the time that she lived to really understand the impact of what's going on here. There was much more social pressure put on a woman to have children back then because this was the structure of society. This is how culture thrived. It thrived because moms are having babies. That's how it thrived. You also think about retirement. Uh, obviously, no Social Security, no 401Ks back then. So who did you count on in your older years? You, you count on children, the children you bear. That's how you live life then. Hannah did not have this. And so the pressure, the shame that she was dealing with was great. But it's interesting to me when you look through the Bible, the women that struggled with infertility in the Bible, all were righteous women. Notice that. You have Sarah, you have Rebecca, you have Rachel, you have Elizabeth, all struggled with infertility. And what happens typically in our lives when desperation comes, what we have a tendency to do during desperate moments is that, that we push God away instead of crying out to Him. And that's kind of the human response because we feel somewhat like a pariah. We feel like an outcast when we go through desperate times and again, God's leaning into you right now if that's true about your life. And maybe, maybe your desperation isn't infertility. Maybe it's failing health or a broken marriage. Maybe it's a rebellious child. Maybe it's the strain of finances right now in your life. And you're angry with God and you feel that God has let you down and that God has left you and that he hasn't come through for you. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 3, it tells us that Elkanah and his two wives made a, a yearly visit to a place called Shiloh. Uh, Jerusalem wasn't the center of worship at this time. It becomes the center of worship later. But at this time, it's Shiloh. Shiloh is the place that you go worship and you offer sacrifices. And it's about a 25-mile journey. And they would go and they would worship the Lord and offer sacrifices. So then you listen to verses 6 and 7 and what it says here. It says, because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. And this went on year after year after year. And whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her until she wept and would not eat. This is an awful situation that Hannah faces, and maybe today 
We would call it bullying. That's what we would call what Hannah was experiencing because Pinna would make fun of Hannah, uh, bullied her so much that Hannah wasn't even able to eat. And I, I don't know, maybe she developed a little bit of an eating disorder because that can happen when you're bullied like this, especially when you're shamed publicly for something that you have no control over, something you don't have, something that you, you can't make happen. So there's a great deal of shame that comes with this. And Hannah was dealing with shame, something she couldn't change. And some of you know this kind of desperation where you've been pushed around and you've been bullied. And for Hannah, it was year after year after year, it was the same thing. You see, pain plus time equals de desperation. That's the formula. That's what brings desperation about in our lives. And in verse 8, her husband, he tries to, to make her feel better. He tries to comfort his wife, Hannah. And uh, my opinion, he doesn't do a great job with it. In fact, he stumbles around with this. And guys, don't take your cues from Elkanah here. Please don't do that. Because in verse 8, what he says, his, it says her husband, Elkanah, would say to her, Hannah... Why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? And here's the, here's, the, here's the worst thing you could say. Don't I mean more than ten sons to you? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, he's trying his best, but the guy, he's not really a romantic here. He's, He's trying to make her feel better, and he's doing an awful job with trying to make her feel better. He's trying. He's doing the best he can, but he's mi missing it. I don't know if he's a rookie. I don't know much about this guy, but every, when I read this, I want to close my ears because this isn't good advice for guys that have wives and moms. This guy has two wives, and it seems to me he should have figured this out by now. He sees her upset, and he tells her not to feel upset. Number one mistake right there. Do not tell your wife how she should feel. It doesn't work. If you do, duck. <laughs> you know, and th this, is, th this is going nowhere fast. This is a huge no-no. It doesn't work. But then he tries to assume that he's the solution. So he inserts himself is in as Superman. And, and he says, you know what, baby? <laughs> you got me. I mean, why do you need a child? You got me. All I can say is Brad Pitt couldn't even pull that one off. I, I really don't think so. I don't think he could pull that off. Listen, the goal of parenting isn't to be a super parent. And I want to put our parents, especially our young parents, at ease right now. You don't have to do everything everyone's telling you to do. And certainly I know that, you know, there are times that social media will exasperate that because everyone on social media, I was going to say lies about all this, but I'm not going to say that. They embellish the truth because we all struggle. We all have problems and if you're taking your cues from what everyone else is doing, you're going to feel bad about yourself because you're comparing yourself to what you think someone else is doing better than you. One of the things we're dealing with today is this complex and shame of trying to be a super parent. And I want to say to parents here today, take a break. You're not called to be a super parent. The goal of parenting is to be a woman and to be a man of God for your children. That's the goal. That's what we've been called to do. That's the goal of parenting. And so Hannah is desperately empty and her husband can't fill her. And then you look at uh, verse 9. Verse 9 says this. Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. Now I want you to pay attention to one phrase here. The phrase is, Hannah got up. It has nothing to do with her physical posture. It has everything to do with her spiritual posture. 
what is being said there to us is Hannah got tired of being pushed around. She got tired of being in the state she was in, and she rose up on the inside. And that's where breakthroughs start for you, is when you raise up on the inside and say, you know what, I'm not going to be bullied around by the schemes of the enemy or the voices of those telling me something contrary to God's word. I am a child of God. And it says here that she stands up. This is that idea that she rose up inside. She had enough living the way that she was living, and she was going to do something different. So Hannah gets up, and she prays this desperate prayer. She asks, she seeks, and she knocks. Matthew 7, 7, and 8. That's what she does. And then in verse 10, it says, In her deep anguish, listen to this, In her deep anguish, prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. Verse 11, And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son. Weeping bitterly. You hear that and you think, well, what's happening here? I want to say this, it's not quietly. This literally means that she's yelling out, (laughs) that anyone that was close by could hear her weeping bitterly. She's tired of holding it in now. She's tired of being quiet about it. This desperate place brings her to say something out loud to God, to cry out loud to God. It means that 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 is exactly what she's doing. And verse 11 Hannah says to God, you give me a son and I will give him back to you. What she's saying there is this, I I will put him in ministry. (laughs) Uh, He will serve you. Now, there's something that Hannah is not doing here and you have to probably know what that is. Hannah is not negotiating with God. She's not into a negotiation with God. She knows that you can't negotiate with someone who has everything. There's no negotiation. When you go to the table empty-handed and the person that you're talking to has everything, it's not a negotiation. What this is, what you're hearing, what you're witnessing, is this is surrender. Total, absolute surrender. Hannah will give her son to God. You know, I know there's a lot of fear in the world we live in today, and you know, a lot of us, we've responded to that fear by kind of hunkering down more, you know, um, holding on to the things that have been given to us with a tighter grip. But what I think is happening here is something that we could learn as well. When it comes to your kids, there's only one person you can trust them with, and that's God. And it's not even me as a father or Annette as a mother. It's trusting them ultimately with God and saying, these are your kids. (laughs) God, these are your kids. Even when they mess up, they're your kids. And I don't know how many might not be in the practice of doing that. But I want to encourage you to trust God with your kids. Because this will only bring fruitful outcomes. This will only bring kingdom outcomes. This is how it happens. Not when we hold on to them and not let them experience the grace of God in their life. Not let them experience moments when they encounter God. I want to see our kids encounter God's spirit. Give your kids to God. Desperation should lead us to this place of surrender. So here are some things to notice. The first thing to notice in this is, uh, the first thing you notice is that Hannah's desperation, uh, in her desperation, she looks to God. So it gives us a cue there. It gives us a, 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 a hint. What should we do here? Well, the first thing we should do is we should lean into God. She realizes she can't do anything and God can do everything. She realizes that. She went so far as to say he's going to be a Nazarite. 
That just means that he's going to grow his hair. He's going to stand out in the crowd. People are going to know that he's anointed by God, that he's called by God. And I know that's hard for us to do these days, but that's exactly what's happening here. She says, my son will not only be set apart, but he will take a Nazarite vow, and everyone's going to know he's a God-fearing man. There's no way to get around it because his outside looks like a God-fearing man. And so what does she do? She looks to God and she says, God, you're the one. You're the only one that I can look to. I've come to the end of my rope. I've come to the end of negotiating. I've come to the end of myself, the end of manipulating. And what I'm saying is you're the one. I look to you. So she realizes she cannot do anything and that God can do everything. It's a good phrase to hold on to. You can't do anything. God can do everything. Just repeat that a few times. You can't do anything. God can do everything. And then the second thing is, in Hannah's desperation, she humbly asks God to look at her. Wow. Not only is she looking at God, but she's saying, God, would you look at me? Would you see me? Would you see my undoneness? Would you see everything about me because when God looks at us that's exactly what he does he sees everything about us and so she said God examine my heart here I am and I think what she's saying here is she's saying God I know you're all powerful I'm calling on you almighty God the powerful God but she also understands something else about God and then he's not only all powerful but she understands he's all loving And this is the way she's relating to God right here. She's relating to God as a loving God. And knowing that that love can change her life, can transform her. That love can give her the son that she desires. And that's why she's saying, God, look at me. I'm looking at you, now you look at me. This is about a relationship. I mean, it's about going eye to eye. It's about going toe to toe. It's about going nose to nose and saying, God, I'm not afraid to get into your space. You're not afraid to get in my space. We're going to do this together. That's amazing. That's what this courageous woman does. So God not only has the power, but he has the heart to meet us in our desperation. The heart to meet us in our desperation. And again, I know as parents... You might be going through times of desperation, a mom, a father, a grandmother, a grandfather, going through those times. What I want to do right now is I want to introduce you to some parents that that are part of our church family, and I so love and appreciate them. And I'm just, I've asked Scott and Amy Edwards if they would just come up here, and and they have a story that, uh, that, that, that you need to hear. And I was with them a few weeks ago, and, um, heard part of this story, kind of the end part of the story, and I thought, wow, we all need to hear this because this is what it looks like to be desperate parents today. And uh, we've been on the journey together for the last few years, praying and talking, and, and I know there have been several moments of desperation. And so I want you to just share with us what that story is for us. So over the last 14 years, we've been praying for Scott's nephew, and the last three years have had the opportunity to have him in our home and just recently adopted him. So I'm going to let Scott start the the story. Um, Yeah, so we adopted him in May. Um, That was a little over three years after um, he was taken from my sister by child services. And so our prayers began for him back in 2003 when we found out that she was pregnant. Uh, My sister suffers from mental illness. She suffers from some substance abuse and the occult. Um, You know, I love her dearly, but it's hard and it's painful. And um, about 2012, she she gave my dad a letter, and it it was pretty pretty horrible. And I remember my dad um, handing it to me and and reading it and saying, you know, what do we do? What are we going to do about Caden? And my dad was was dying at the time. And um, he was really, he he fought for Caden for years and years Mm. and years. And um, I told him that we're just going to keep praying and that God will take him from her at some point and we would take him in. But deep down inside, I don't know that that's really what I felt was going to happen because there are so many times that could have happened and then their cruel twist of fate would would change things. But God was faithful and we did get him finally. So we 
we felt like we were on both sides of the desperate prayer, that Scott's parents prayed desperately. That turned our hearts. We prayed desperately. Mm. Um, so we were able to, ha to have relationship with Caden really sporadically over his life. Um, but something that was really monumental for me is that it was a hard, hard process having two older kids and then this 11-year-old who comes in who's, who's mentally more like nine, mm -hmm. um, just very delayed due to severe neglect. Mm -hmm. So really hard. And a few years before Caden came, my mom made me this great little photo display. And that's a picture of it. Um, but you'll notice that blank spot, which was really odd because my mom has made a lot of things for me over the years and she's never given me anything that was unfinished. And she said, I just couldn't find the right picture to go there and I knew you'd have something and you could finish it. And I thought, okay, you know, but I never did. I just never got around to finding a picture to put in that spot. And it sat on my counter for several years. And about a year and a half ago, in the midst of this struggle and desperation, God showed me that. And he said, I saved a place for Caden in your family. Mm -hmm. And so now this is what it looks like. <laughs> there he is. And right in between our other two kids, there was a spot for Caden to be. So that is a, just a constant reminder to me that God has been working all along so we still covet your prayers because we're still in the midst of it, but um, it's been good. God is good. Scott and Amy, that's just, it's been incredible. And I know Annette and I have witnessed your journey and um, we've texted each other back and forth. Yeah. Please pray, please pray. And we've done it together. And uh, here God's brought an answer. Uh, Caden's the answer. Yeah. So thank you. you thank you. Thank you for sharing that story with us. <clears throat> Caden had his um, adoption party here a few weeks ago, and I would miss that for the world. Just wouldn't miss it for the world. And so uh, Annette and I were there, and <clears throat> I kind of like Caden. Caden kind of likes me. If you've ever seen me out in the front playing catch with, uh, with someone playing baseball, it's him. Uh, so I'd rather probably do that sometimes. I hate to say this than to come into church, but I do come into church. Uh, but we play baseball together, and I told Amy, I got to do one more thing. On three, take a picture. And when she did, I just kissed him. And so I said, see, you have to put up with that, man. Just got to put up with it. But God is so faithful, and when we come to him in our desperation, he always comes through. Whatever it is that you're dealing with in those des times of desperation, he comes through. I want to finish our time together by doing one other thing, and that is very important to Annette and I, and, and it's something that we practice um, all of our lives. And the reason we practice this is because uh, my mom and dad practiced the, um, the act of anointing with oil. Uh, anointing oil represents, for those that might not know, represents really oil represents the work of God's Holy Spirit. The anointing of oil represents God's domain. This is the, you know, this is the domain of God's Holy Spirit. And what is the first and most important domain of God's Holy Spirit? It's us. We're living in holy sacrifices. And that we would, when I was growing up, we would, my dad and mom would anoint us with oil. You know, and it was, I'm, they were saying to us as, as our children, we're setting you apart that the Holy Spirit has domain in your life. And that you will follow the call of God on your life. And, and they believed in faith doing that. That's how they did it. And then we also anoint uh, the, our home. We went, we, the door posts of our house. Uh, if you go through this building, you'll probably find oily spots that my dad has gone through here. Can't keep him out. He just goes to different places and gets oil everywhere. And that's, a, that, that's something that's been passed down to us. And we want to pass it on to you. Because one of the things we did when we got together with those young families a few weeks ago is at the very end, Annette and I prayed for all of our young families. And um, we asked them as they left if they would do one thing that while they were being prayed for, they would also go home and pray for their children. And they would pray over their house. And their house is God's domain. And so we handed out some uh, vials of oil and they took those and prayed over their kids. 
And what we want to do today is do the same thing, that when you leave grandparents or parents, we want you to take a, a vial of oil and one per family, whatever, however that looks for you, just take one, and that you would anoint your children with oil. This is not a time to be casual about the lives and the spiritual well-being of our children. This is the time that we need to stand up and we need to ask, we need to seek, and we need to knock. This is the time. And one of the ways we do that is we're just obedient to God and say, God, we believe that you have the best in mind for us and we're going to de our, dedicate our kids to you. We're going to dedicate them to you uh, through the anointing of oil. And so that's what we're going to do. When you go, there'll be people standing at the doors and you can just grab a vial out of there. But pray over your children. Pray over your grandchildren. Pray over your home. Annette and I have written scripture inside of our closet, just writing scripture that says, this is the house of the Lord. And so we want to pass that on to you, give you something to take. If you don't already do this, take this with you and practice this to remind yourself that you are God's and that you trust in him. Father, we just thank you today for this time that we're able to spend together and just kind of take that first step in this series, The Gift of Desperation. Uh, and I know there are probably many of us in this room that are going through desperate times, don't necessarily see it as a gift, but as we walk through it with you, it, it is a gift. It's tremendous. Because we get on the other side and we see things you already saw. We see things that you've done through this whole time, things that you've done in our lives to get us to the place we are now, outside on the other side of desperation, looking back and saying, God, you are wonderful. That's how your people sing your praises. And that, that's why they sing your praises is because of your faithfulness and your ability and only your ability to lead us through difficult times. So, Lord, we just pray right now in Jesus' name. We pray the anointing of your Holy Spirit would rest upon us, rest upon our children and our children's children, rest upon this place and our homes and our community. In Jesus' name we pray and we say amen.